music appreciation class i'm gonna get a little i'm gonna move a little bit because today we have a very very special guest today and it's one of my favorite instruments of course the drums it's my good friend matt ogawa give him a round of applause students thank you so much um hey everyone out there i'm so happy to be here and um thank you to uh, mr imamura for inviting me uh, to have this talk with you but really happy to be here today to talk a little bit about um, culture, art, music, um, and how I'm involved in all that. Yes. Now, students, Matt plays an awesome instrument called the drums. In fact, he actually plays a very specific kind of drum. And Matt, what kind of drum is that? Yes. So I play the Japanese drum, um, which in Japanese is called taiko, T-A-I-K-O. Taiko is sort of a general word for drum. So there's a lot of different sizes and different types. Um, but I have been studying and practicing that now for about 26 years. Oh my goodness. How can you be practicing 26 years when you're only 27 years old? That doesn't make yeah. any sense to me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, it's magic, right? <laughs> I love that. Now, so in, 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 in Japanese, taiko means drum. And what do you call the drumsticks that you use to hit the taiko drum? Yeah, so um, again, it's another um, sort of a general term, it's called bachi, B-A-C-H-I. Um, and that's the Japanese word for drumstick. So again, a lot of different sizes, weights, different types of wood used. Um, some people make their own by going to the hardware store and getting wooden dowels. Um, and then others are made in Japan out of Japanese oak and shipped over from, from, from Japan. So lots of, lots of different meanings there, but yeah, they're called bachi. Nice. And now, uh, do you share a bocce or like, do you, do you have to like, when you, do you have to get, go into the forest and cut down a tree and like make your own bocce? How does that work? Um, well, we, I mean, I have done both. I have gone to the hardwood store and made them out of wooden dowels that you just kind of cut and sand down. Um, and then I've also gotten some from Japan that they make from rec reclaimed wood, um, Japanese oak in Japan. Um, and so in terms of sharing, I mean, as a, as a group and a lot of different folks that I've played with, whether they're in um, the group that I'm in or not, uh, most of us, I think all of us have our own drumsticks that we own, several different, different sizes, which actually at the moment are in our studio, which is closed because of the pandemic, but, um, but also people share. So our group has a, a, a supply of drumsticks that we share, or bocce that we share, so that when we have friends visit us or when we have other people come in, they wanna learn the art form, we have, um, obviously, they're not going to have their own bocce to bring, so we have them some that they can borrow. And the taiko drums, they are, they range in a variety of sizes from small to like gigantic, like the size of a car, basically. Yep. And how, like, how do you practice at home um, when you have various sizes of taiko? Yeah, so um, a lot of times it's easier just to go to our studio and practice um, because obviously we have the space for it. But I realized that many students of Taiko don't have the luxury of going to a place to study. So you get creative and that's part of being an artist, right? So um, I, I myself, uh, I may practice on, um, you know, a stack of books wrapped in clothes, wrapped in old t-shirts to kind of get a silent feel for it. Others may, it may use sort of big garbage cans wrapped in tape to get sort of that drum sound. Um, others use what we call air bocce. So you just kind of practice in the air um, without anything. So you just get creative. It depends on how much space you have at home, in your room, what your neighbors might hear or not hear. So we just want to be thoughtful about all that. So yeah, lots of different ways you can, you can practice. Very cool. And now Taiko is not just drumming, but it's also 
a lot of movement and like choreography. And what's, what is your background in that? Like, did you study dance and drums and get into taiko? Like, how did you get it all started? Yeah, so that's a really great question. And um, I know when I was first started, I, I, I'll back up a little bit. I, I don't have any musical background. And when I was growing up, um, I think it was in third grade, um, everybody played what was called a song flute. And that was just to get a very introductory um, view into what music means and you learn the basic scale. And then after, after we did that in third grade, I really hadn't played any type of music. When I got into taiko um, and specifically the group in San Jose, um, it was drumming incorporated with a lot of different movement. And so um, I did, I also studied um, what's called uh, Nihon Buyo, which is Japanese classical dancing because I wanted to learn how to dance, although it was a great skill to have, but I wanted to be able to be, uh, to know and be aware of my body and how, how we move so that there could be more intention behind the movement. Because um, one of the things we learn in the Taiko art form is it's not just about striking the instrument, right? It's about how you hold your, bo your body, what your posture is, your presence on stage, your interaction with other players. Um, and the, the study of the Japanese classical dance really helped me understand and become aware of you know, my whole body and how I use it and, or didn't use it or where I, what muscles I needed to flex and that kind of stuff. So it's been, for me, it's been very, very useful. Yeah, that's why I love Taiko so much is because it's you're not just sitting behind a drum and playing like this. It's all movement. It's it's interacting with the audience and it's just it's it's a visual experience. You can feel the music and then you can also see the passion that all the all the artists and musicians have on the stage and and students. Sounds like Taiko is one of the most famous Taiko groups in the entire world. Like you guys are best friends with Kodo, right? Kodo from Japan. Yeah, we, we have a long history with Kodo from Japan. Oh, that is so awesome. Yeah. And uh, also, Matt, those the outfits that you wear, the traditional outfits, what is that called? Yeah, so the costumes that Taiko players wear, wear are called Hapi um, or, or a Hapi coat, um, H-A-P-P-I. And, um, you know, some of it is form and function. You know, the, the, the instrument that's now used in what you might see at a concert or a festival or even in some cases a music video, um, back, back in more ancient times in Japan was actually more of a ritual, um, a part of a ritual or a religious ceremony. Um, but just within the last 65, 70 years, even in Japan, it's become more of a performance art, which is really cool that it still can be used for both. The costumes um, really help accentuate anything from how you move um, to uh, you know visually what you look like on a stage or outdoors, whether there's lighting or whether you're at a festival. So um, if you're at a festival, your hoppy might be brighter colors. Um, and if you're in a more serious concert or a more formal event, might be darker colors or more muted colors. And then um, we also, taiko players often wear other things um, like uh, you might have a band around your wrist or a, a headband, which we call a hachimaki. Um, and while those really look nice too as part of the costume, um, they help sweat from running down your face um, or, or, you know, more functional things like that or help keep, you know, if you have longer hair, it will help keep your hair out of your face, things like that. So um, yeah, lots of things to consider. Um, it's not, you know, sometimes like when I was playing the song flute in third grade, you just sit in the chair and you play your flute. But um, this, in order to be fully uh, playing, performing, embodying the spirit um, of our group in San Jose. Um, it, it's about the costuming. It's about the movement. It's about how the technique of striking the drum. Very cool. That's yeah. awesome. And my first time that I ever seen San Jose Taiko perform and pretty much you perform was uh, at the San Jose Obon. And for students that are listening and even adults that are listening right now in the city of San Jose, California, there is a beautiful village called Japantown in the heart, really outside of uh, downtown San Jose, where they uh, have an annual festival. And can you talk a little bit about that Obon Festival? Yeah, so um, Obon, which is O-B-O-N, is a festival in Japan um, where, and in Japan, it's, it's, it's interesting. It actually falls on one day, um, I believe in August, just as a holiday would here in the U.S. And um, it's, a, it's a holiday that really looks to um, appreciate your ancestors that have passed away in that past year since the last festival. And, um, 
you know, in some senses, the festival is to ward off evil spirits. Um, and then in other senses, it's really to um, make sure that you're looking back and appreciating those that, that have passed on. Now in San Jose and many other Japanese communities across the country, um, they have these um, obon festivals or summer festivals. Um, and some people often ask, um, why are there so many different festivals on different weekends, even though the holiday is usually only on one day? It's, it's so that every community center or temple or whoever is holding the festival, um, that they don't all happen on the same weekend and people can enjoy different festivals. So yeah, but the festival in San Jose is, um, I believe, the largest in North America. So that's claim to fame for San Jose, go Bay Area. Um, and it is a time where, um, you know, folks can gather, people that have grown up in San Jose, maybe moved away, can come back home, um, really enjoy each other's company, have fun. Um, and in San Jose, our, our local temple in, in the heart of Japantown actually uses it as their annual fundraiser as well. So I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, thousands of volunteers come together um, and donate their time and energy to put this two-day event together, which always happens the um, second week of July. Um, and, and yeah, and, and taiko and Japanese um, uh, dancing, and, et cetera, is a big part of that festival. Yes, yes. Yeah. It is such a great festival because it's just a time where the community gets together um, and it's 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 awesome. Everybody is, of course, welcome to that festival and great food, awesome food, yeah. <laughs> lots of fun games. And number one, you get to see San Jose Taiko perform live in front of you because usually um, you guys are performing at performing arts centers, um, huge you know festivals and whatnot. And the fact that the community can come and see you right up in there and you can like literally feel the music is absolutely amazing and and i just yeah. i just adore you guys so much <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you that's it's pretty awesome i mean it's it's probably one of my favorite performances we do every year our group does you know over 150 types of performances in a year's time and um every year it tends to be one of my favorite ones in, in years where we can actually perform at them um but you know, it's. I think most of our group performs. We're there for two days. Um, and the the festival is free, but that means that you are. We are right in the street, in the middle of the street, performing. There's there's lanterns hanging over our heads, and um, we are just surrounded 360 by fans, family, friends, community members. Um, and it's it definitely feels like a homecoming. It's it's so much fun to interact with the audience that way. Ah, that's so cool. I love yeah. it. I want it. I wanted to, I want to go to it now. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, how did you get like started in San Jose Taiko? Like, did yeah. you just, you know, were, were they having classes? Like, can a student actually take a class that's watching right now? Yes. Um, so yeah, how I, I'll start with how I got started. Um, I was in high school and I had a bunch of friends who were, you know, picking up different instruments. And um, none of those really spoke to me. And um, one of my friends who had actually moved here from Japan um, had started taking taiko classes. And um, I had always seen it growing up at different, but you know, it's the same as you have. And um, I wanted to try it. So um, he was a member of a group in San Francisco. And so I went with him to a couple of classes. Uh, again, this is back in high school. Um, I really liked it, but I knew I was gonna be going down to um, uh, study in San Jose and I had other friends that were taking classes in San Jose's taiko group which I'll get to in a second and uh, yeah just tried it liked it um, and so uh, we I was actually just graduating high school at the time so um, I was I started to audition for our adult performing group but we do have many San Jose taiko has many classes for for young children um, right now and um, normally our classes are once a week for about an hour hour and a half um, in San Jose near downtown. Um, and we, we run the classes, they follow the school year. So they'll start in August, September timeframe, end in the summer. And then there's a recital at the end for all the other students and families and friends. Um, and it's great to learn about music. It's great to learn about um, culture. And um, yeah, if anyone wants information on that, they can visit our Taiko website, which is taiko, T-A-I-K-O dot O-R-G. Um, and there's a ton of information on on classes and workshops. We we also have one day workshops too. Oh, that's great! And adults and kids can uh, take those classes, right? Yeah, we have kids classes. We have adult classes. We have classes with kids and adults together. 
We have senior citizen classes. So I, you, we cover the whole spectrum. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's amazing. That yeah. is so awesome. And yes, we definitely, students, adults that are listening right now, please go to that website and check it out, <laughs> sign up, take some classes. Um, and just a little bit of background about me. I actually took Tyco lessons when I was in high school as well. And I went into there um, not knowing, I was playing drums, like a drum drum set, but learning Tyco, I, it actually made me a better performer because I use my arm movements whenever I play live and, and I incorporate Tyco influence into my drum set playing and also on the trash cans that I play on as well. And <laughs> I just, I love it. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just being around community. Tyco creates that, that like, you know, um, that just love for one another. And I just, I really appreciate it and, and everything that, that Tyco brings. So yeah. it, it's awesome. Yeah. Now, Matt, I know you have some pretty interesting or maybe embarrassing stories when you performed. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most embarrassing moment that you've ever had performing with Sounds Like Tycho? Okay, well, I, I, I think the students will love this one. Um, I love this story now, but I didn't, I didn't necessarily love what happened. But, you know, uh, as we've been talking about this entire time, um, Tycho is not, you know, normal, normally in a, in a Western trap set, you'll be sitting behind your drums and you'll be, you'll be playing. Well, Tycho is all about being up and moving around. Um, and, you know, there's jumps and there's spins and there's a lot of choreography. Well, uh, we were doing a performance once and um, I uh, was getting up from sitting down um, in a song. And then when I went backstage, I realized I had split my pants in the back. Um, and did not have enough time to go back, uh, you know, to change because I needed to go right back on. And, you know, as, a, as an artist or a performer, you make quick decisions. And my decision at the moment was, we just got to go with it and make it work. So I went out there, we did our finale piece, um, me and my ripped pants. But, you know, um, I feel as a, as a music, musician or an artist, you just got to sell it, right? You just got to make the best of it. And so, look, now it's a fun story. We could laugh about it, but at the moment, uh, it was probably one of the most embarrassing things that that I can remember as a, as a in a performance. <laughs> <laughs> and students, I want you to hear that loud and clear. The show must go on. If you yes. forget your lines, if you're acting, you improv. If you drop a drumstick, you pick it up, you keep going. You split your pants open, your underwear's hanging out, you still keep on going and you own it. <laughs> that's that's the best advice I ever had. And, and actually. Um, I, you, you may think this sounds a little bit corny, but you know, it being a performer, um, and, a, and an artist for me personally in the early years, when I first started to take up performing arts, um, you know, when I was in school, um, uh, school was great. I liked learning and going through the books and all that, and that kind of stuff, but the life lessons I got through art, um, can't be compared to anything. Um, and even though I laugh about, you know, splitting my pants and going out there and selling it. You, you learn lessons about, I love that phrase, like show must go on because that's what happens in life. You know, you don't always, a book can't always give you the answer. Sometimes you have to experience things and live through things. Um, so whether it's how to collaborate with people, whether it's how to express yourself um, or, or, or communicate, you know, an emotion or how you're feeling or whether how to just go with it in the moment, you know, I don't learn that from school. I learned it from music and arts. Oh, that's awesome. Very yeah. cool. Now, Matt, you are kind of a history buff in the Japanese culture, specifically here in San Jose. And can you give us a, just a little bit of feedback about how Japantown here in San Jose became what it is and, and you know, maybe the, the influences of Taiko and, and culture within that? Yeah. Um, you know, Japantown um, is, is not just... Um, you know, if you drive through it, you might think, oh, this is a place where there's a lot of Japanese restaurants in one area and, and there's a couple churches and temples. Um, it's a lot more than that. You know, Japantown, this goes way back to even pre-World War II when there was a lot of um, discrimination happening against Asians and Asian Americans. And um, it really, it really the, 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 the town represents a community, um, a, a coming together and a rebuilding. Um, so I am the son of um, American, so I'm fourth generation um, American. So my grandparents were born, all of my grandparents were born in the United States and my parents and myself. And so um, what, that, what that meant was, um, you know, in World War II, when my family was incarcerated in internment camps, um, they didn't even know how to speak Japanese. They'd never been to Japan. 
Um, and to me, you know, Japantown in San Jose, and there's, there's a couple other Japantowns in LA and San Francisco represent a rebuilding of community. So um, Japantown actually started as a Chinatown years and years and years ago. Um, and I won't get into all the details. I don't want to make it a history lesson, but over time and due to the war, um, you know, it, it ended up becoming um, what it is today, more so what's known today as a, as a Japantown. And it really represents families coming together and rebuilding and making a life for themselves right now. And so um, I had this identity crisis growing up because, you know, I thought I, I would be um, a, a kid in school and see that these there were some um, foreign exchange students from Japan. And I would think I'm nothing like those those kids. But to all my non-Asian friends, they just put us all into one bucket. But to me, what Japantown represents is Japanese American a Japanese American a hyphenated culture. So I'm, I, I was not born in Japan. I'm not Japanese from Japan. I'm Japanese American. Um, and so my identity is reflected in Japantown today, which has more than just Japanese food, more than just Japanese people, more than just Japanese arts. And it's perfect that um, a group like San Jose Taiko, and there are many others, but um, you know, it, like San Jose Taiko exists in Japantown because you know, back in the, the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of political movements happening and specifically for Asian Americans, um, this was a way to give them a voice back then, um, you know, and especially as an art form, there weren't any, I would say there weren't any, but there were very, it was very rare that you'd find a Japanese or even Asian American art form. And so this was, you know, people, you know, second generation, third generation Japanese Americans back in the 60s and 70s saying, we want something, whether an art form, a musical instrument that represents our cultural identity and gives us a voice. What better thing to give you a voice than a large drum, right? Um, and so that being a part of Japantown and just the story behind it. Um, yeah, Japantown really represents a community of rebuilding. Yes. Ah, oh, yeah. round of applause right there. <laughs> round of applause, students. That is awesome. If you're listening to this, you live here in the Bay Area, California, San Jose, you haven't had a chance to check out Japantown, you got to check it out. Take a drive to Japantown. It's such a rad little community. Um, it's one of my favorite coffee shops is down there. Roy's Coffee Station. Shout out. Yes. <laughs> Serving that Verve coffee. <laughs> and also, there's also some other great restaurants that are down there as well. And the annual uh, Obon Festival happens down there. And there's other festivals that happen down there too, right? Yeah, there's a couple other festivals. Um, some pop up on a, you know, here and there basis. Others are annual. But yeah, definitely, um, you know, check out. There's there's different groups for Japantown on Facebook and um, and on the Japantown, San Jose Japantown website. So check it out. There's a lot of information there. Very cool. Now, I want to find out what were your musical influences like? Did you listen to any type of music when, um, you know, getting inspired to play taiko? Um, I, I did not. I mean, I love music. I like all types of music, um, you know, whether it's classical or country or, you know, cultural or um, folk arts, um, R&B, uh, alternative, all that kind of stuff, rock. Um, so I, um, I love music. And so less than, um, rather than one genre of music, for me, it was what is something that inspires me, you know, things that are upbeat, things that kind of get me going, um, good rhythms, a good message. Um, I love to hear the story behind why a song was composed or written, things like that, because that inspires me. And so um, you know, I'm the person who in the morning when I'm waking up, you need, I have a certain playlist or when I go running, I have a certain playlist. So it's all about what gets me going and um, inspires me. And so I could, I could name songs out of every genre that represent that. <laughs> yes. And students, I want you to listen to that. Matt Ogawa, professional taiko drummer, professional musician. He listens to all different styles of music and whatever inspires him. So whatever mood. So uh, our encouragement today for you is to listen to all varieties of music, all cultures of, of styles of music and everything else. And something else that I want to just touch on and, and actually go back to is that Taiko is not just drumming, it's performance art. It's, it's, you know, it's movement. And uh, it's just such a great physical thing to do, as well as, you know, bringing people together, bringing community together. And uh, I think it's, it's just such an amazing way also to build lifelong friendships, right? Yep. Absolutely. I mean, uh, there are people that were in the group when I first joined back in 1996, and we're still really good friends and, um, and, and people in the community and, you know, how we can, you and I can stay connected and things like that. So, um, yeah, there's all, all different ways that um, it impacts your life, positive ways where it impacts your life. 
Definitely. Oh my goodness. Students, let's give Matt a loud round of applause. Oh, he can Thank feel you it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I oh my goodness. I can hear it. I can feel it from all over. They're standing up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so overwhelmed, even even more than I am with music. Thank you, everyone, for your energy. <laughs> Matt, thank you so much for joining us here today. Students, make sure you check out San Jose Taiko. Make sure you come and visit San Jose. It's a beautiful Japan town. And one more time, let's give it up for my man, Matt Ogawa. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me today. Students, thank you so much for checking out Music Appreciation today. Have an awesome day, and we'll see you next time.